Okay. Well, hey, thanks again for the opportunity to be here. And uh, I am glad that we got to know how the game turned out so everybody can just refocus here and attention is, is on the scriptures. Um, you know, I began last night in Acts chapter 2 and really to select the passages to do this is a little bit tricky because I want to I wanna cover some ground and get to Acts chapter 9 and this transition from a purely Jewish focus to a, to a predominantly Gentile focus in the book of Acts. And uh, I didn't mention this last night, but the key verse in Acts 1.8 is, You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Acts 1-7, through 7, the gospel stays in Jerusalem. Acts 8 through 12, it goes to Judea and Samaria. Acts 13 through 28, it is progressing to the ends of the earth. And so that's pretty amazing how that works out. Speaking of the ends of the earth, uh, a little bit about Ethnos 360 before I get started. Um, so, you know, as Thomas said, April and I are missionaries with Ethnos 360. And the ministry that we had for years, like 16 years on campus at New Tribes Bible Institute, we changed our name, um, but same, same organization. And in the last several years, working from a distance with Ethnos 360 Bible Institute online. And this is really cool. Like we, we had this vision to create an online campus and it took a long time to get approval to do that because it's different. <laughs> That's a big long story and I won't tell it right now. But anyway, it was a God thing really that it worked out. And um, anyway, we were building this, and the goal was to launch in fall of 2021, and then COVID hit. And this was like in May of 2020, May, June, I think it was already June, the president of the Bible Institute called me and said, Scott, can you all be ready to launch fall 2020? And I'm looking at the curriculum that we'd already developed, and I'm like, you know what? I think we can. Literally, we had students that started the full program fall 2020, Literally by, by this past year, last May, were our first graduates. We were about three months ahead of them, sometimes less, building classes that they needed to graduate. So we barely got it done, but it was great. Quality's good. And uh, what I want to tell you about is that after we film these classes, you know, and there's, and, and I mean, you might want to take one. They're just like 170 credit hour. Three ways to study online. Uh, you can take individual courses, you can take a 30 credit hour certificate of biblical studies, or you can take a 64 hour associate degree. And those are options that we have, but we also discovered that, you know, we really just want to be a blessing to the body of Christ. And so what we've done is, after we've built, you know, we filmed these in a studio, we've got assignments built around them, we extracted those videos from those courses, and we have them in a separate location online, and... We have free courses. So if you put your phone up and put the picture on, it'll take you to the website. Uh, but depending on your culture and your generation, you might also appreciate a business card that has the web address. April's gonna have those on the back podium on your way out the door. But literally these are free classes. Some of them are like 15 hours long. Some of them are two hours long. And we have a Gospel of Mark that's 15 hours. Uh, I did one called Grand Narrative of Scripture that's two hours. It's just boom, snapshot, and it's over. We have one that's on um, Christian culture and, and standing strong in Christian culture. It's a couple hours long, and we're adding new things all the time. So this website, this web address is going to be good forever, and we'll just keep adding new material. So there's a gift to you. I think it's my coat. Yeah. Well, since I have to take off my coat. All right. I'll do it for you all. <laughs> all right. So the book of Acts, turning points in the program of God. Let's pray and we'll dive in. God, thank you so much for my brothers and sisters here at Riverwood. Thank you for the preeminence and the focus of the word of God on the word of God here at Riverwood. And uh, Lord, we just ask that you would challenge our hearts, that you'd be renewing our minds and that you would remind us once again why we're here and what you want us to do as we function as your representatives in a very dark world. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so I'm calling this turning points because something major happened in Acts chapter 2. The day of Pentecost, the Spirit came. This was long expected from the Old Testament, but things didn't happen as expected. 
uh, by and large, you know, the Jews had already rejected Christ. He came to his own. His own did not receive him. And here we are on the other side of the resurrection, the sign of Jonah. How are the Jews going to respond? Peter preached at Pentecost. They were cut to the quick. About 3,000 came to faith in the Lord. So things are looking kind of good. Maybe, just maybe, Israel's ready on this side of the resurrection. So, let's see in Acts chapter 3. And I'm calling this the lame man and the lost nation. And one thing that you'll see is that, obviously, this goes beyond chapter 3. And we're looking at, when I break up the book of Acts, I look at individual stories. The chapter divisions in our English Bibles were added later in time. They were not part of the original Greek manuscripts. And there are reasons for where they're placed, but they're not inspired. And sometimes it obscures the fact that the story continues. I mentioned last night that the miracle is not the message. The miracle gets attention for the message. In Acts chapter 3, we find the miracle. In Acts chapter 4, we find the message. And so that's what we're going to be looking at tonight with the lame man and the lost nation. Now, the first section here, the lame man is healed, Acts chapter 3, verse 1. Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. Ninth hour, I mentioned this last night, they began their count at 6 a.m. in the morning. So the ninth hour of the day is 3 in the afternoon. This is the time when the evening sacrifice would be offered at the temple. And this is the time when they would have evening prayers. And they would picture their prayers going up before the Lord like this smoke from this burnt offering. And what's interesting about this, catch this detail... Here we are, this is the church. This is after Pentecost, but these Jewish Christians saw no problem with going to the temple. You know, the Old Testament had predicted that Messiah would come. They didn't see a conflict with this. There was no conflict. So so this separation of the church as this distinct identity from Israel, it hasn't been that prominent yet. It will be as the book unfolds until later on they'll be called Christians because they're their own distinct group. Uh, Right now, they're still going to the temple. Well, what you find, uh, I guess I should show you this, um, because this is going to show up in the story here. Verse 2, a lame man from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate. They set him there to ask alms of those entering the temple. And so what you find, a couple of things that will come out in this passage, you have Solomon's porch or Solomon's portico. It was just an area of the temple courtyard, and you'll notice the beautiful gate right here. Now, I'm shaking when I do that, but if I draw a bead on a deer with a 30 alt 6 watch out, all right? So, I can hold my breath and make that happen. Anyway, <laughs> and, uh, and so you can see here, if I got two hands and take a rest, I'm better. <laughs> if this thing had like a crosshair picture instead of that green dot, it would be really cool, wouldn't it? All right, anyway, sorry. Uh, but you see the gate there in the center. So that's where they set this guy. And this was a culturally appropriate way. Like, this is how they cared for people that couldn't care for themselves. It was kind of like a, a, a welfare program, if you will. And so this man is brought there daily and laid at this gate. And he would ask alms for people that enter the temple. Well, Peter and John heal a lame man. Verse 3, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple... He asked to receive alms. And I always smile when I read this because I'm thinking, you're asking preachers for money. (laughs) Come on, this isn't going to get you anywhere. (laughs) All right, that's not a slam on Thomas or me or anybody. It's just, you know. All right, so seeing them, and uh, he asked to receive alms. Verse 4, Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. Now, I want to pause here for just a second because something I want you to see is that we're told in verse 2, the man was lame from birth. Now, if you go over to chapter 4, verse 22, this is going to show you it's all the same story. Chapter 4, verse 22 says, The man on whom the sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. And so this man is lame. He has been lame from birth. He has never walked, and he's over 40 years old. That means... That if you saw him, he would, his legs would probably look like pretzels. He, he's atrophied in his muscles. He's, you know, he's not got the composition to stand up and walk. And so, here he is. He sees Peter and John. 
Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and they said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. Notice verse 6, Peter said, I have no silver and gold. And I'm sure at that moment he kind of dropped his head like, oh. But what I have, (laughs) I give you in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. I'm sorry, just a funny story entered my head. And it's a safe one. Okay, so I took a class at Dallas Seminary called A Biblical Theology of Suffering and Disability. And I had, to, <laughs> I had to spend a day in a wheelchair to experience that. It was a great assignment. All day long from the time I left the house, you know, I got to the Bible Institute. I told my students ahead of time, I'll be in a chair tomorrow. Everything's okay. I get there, and I step out of the car, get in the chair, and from then on, I'm in roll. And uh, you had to go to a public place. Uh, one of my coworkers, Chris Darlin, one of our teachers, sleeps up at Waukesha, Wisconsin now. Uh, he and I went to lunch and saw a guy that used to be on staff at the Bible Institute, and he was looking from a distance. He wouldn't come over. It, and I think he was, like, treating me different because I'm in a wheelchair. And I'm thinking, don't judge me. Anyway, so, so we leave the restaurant, and we go to the public library, and I'm finding it's very difficult to, to maneuver around and all that. <laughs> so I'm in line to check out a book, and the guy in front of me, he turns around grabs my hand and said, in the name of Jesus, may you be healed. (laughs) And I jumped up and said, hallelujah. (laughs) No, I didn't. (laughs) I didn't. But I've regretted it since that day. (laughs) Oh, man. I was told not to go out of roll, so I didn't. And I just thanked him, and then I just kind of ducked my head, and I was just like convulsing in laughter, like, man, this did not just happen. Um, (laughs) Oh, man. So so here we are in the book of Acts, and and, and they say, what I have, you know, I have no silver and gold, but what I have to you, I give you freely. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And notice verse 7. He took him by the right hand, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. This is like, you know, a basketball game when someone's knocked to the floor and you put your toe against their toe and you do that sort of move. Peter is doing this, and as he's lifting him up, the man receives strength. Now, I used to work at a nursing home, and uh, and what I discovered working at the nursing home, if someone has been bedfast, you know, like I mentioned, their muscles atrophy, there's nothing there. And, and I can't imagine what it would be like in an instant. This man who had never walked, he goes from immobile to walking and leaping and praising God. Okay, so get this. This is a miracle. This is something that we read because we're Christians and we can read it and go on. And it's like, hit the brakes. Did you read what just happened? A man who had never walked is walking and leaping and praising God. All right, and this would be one of those cases where it's like, you know, don't tell me to contain myself. Don't tell me that we don't do that in this church, okay? (laughs) This guy is like exuberant. He is rejoicing because he has been healed. And what's amazing is that you find this in verse 8. He leaping, he stood up and began to walk and he entered the temple. Why that detail? Because if you were born with a birth defect or some sort of a physical ailment, you could not go into the temple. Because to go into the temple is the place where God's presence dwells. And nothing impure or unclean or imperfect in that sense can enter the temple. It is representative of the fact that when God dwelt with man in the Garden of Eden... And when God's presence is back on the earth in Revelation 21 and 22, nothing that's broken will be there. And so it was picturing the new heavens and the new earth to come. And this man could never go in there and worship. But because of what just happened, one who was unfit for the presence of God can now enter into the temple and worship. And he is filled with joy. And so verse 9, all the people saw him walking and praising God. And can you imagine this? He's walking and leaping. I'm not even going to like try to attempt this, but imagine a guy's just walking and all of a sudden he's like, man, I'm just, and he just jumps. He's got like a 48 inch vertical, takes a couple more steps, he just jumps again. He's just like, this is awesome. And so he is filled 
with joy. The man responds in spontaneous worship, walking and leaping. He knows, he knows how this happened. He's not praising Peter and John, he's praising God. He's walking and leaping and praising God. So now, this is the way it works. You get a miracle, you get a crowd, you get a message. That's the book of Acts. So, uh, verse 10, or excuse me, verse 9, the people saw him. Verse 10, they recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. So they recognized, we know this guy. This is the one, and this is a miracle because we knew him beforehand. Verse 11, while he clung to Peter and John, so even though he's praising God, he is hugging Peter and John. He's like, you guys are my new best friends. He's just clinging to them. And, uh, and notice verse 11, while he is clinging to Peter and John, this crowd runs together, verse 11 continued, they ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's, there at Solomon's porch, that's where this, this event took place. Well, this creates a scene, and I'm sure that Peter is like looking at the crowd, looking at the man clinging to him, looking at the crowd again, it's like, whoa, 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 it's not what you think, it's not what you think. So he addresses this in verses 12 and following. The gospel is proclaimed. He first is going to show that Jesus is the source of the miracle of healing the lame man. Verse 12, um, and when Peter saw it, he addressed the people. Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our power or piety we made him walk? He says, guys, don't think that we did this. This is not in our capability. This is, as we would say, beyond our pay grade, okay? Uh, we can't do this. So, so he's recognizing that God, yes, worked through them, but God is the one who did the miracle. And then he says in verse 13, The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate. Now, I'm going to stop here and just kind of look at some of these. First of all, to call him, he could could have just said, God did this, right? We're talking Jew to Jew. We know who God is. When when a Jew talks to a Jew, they're not like, wait a minute, are you talking about Baal or Chemosh or who are you talking about? No, they know we're talking about God. So why does he say the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the God of our fathers? He's making it very clear. The same God that you believe in did this. He's connecting that this God, this healing, came from the God that they worship and say that they believe. Okay? And so he just wants to connect that very strong. This is the covenant God. And God's stamp of approval that Jesus is the Messiah is the fact that God did this miracle. It occurred how? Down in chapter 4, verse 12, in the name of Jesus. Okay? So that's where this is going to go as the story unfolds. Well, verse 13, he says this. He says, The God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob glorified his servant, Jesus. That sends off alarms too. Because the servant of Yahweh is the one spoken of in Isaiah 42, Isaiah 49, Isaiah 50, and Isaiah 52, 53. It's the Messiah. And so when he talks about the servant of God, he's talking about Messiah. And he's going to point that to Jesus in just a few minutes. So he takes a messianic view of Isaiah. He's a good man. All right. Uh, And then notice this, how he removes all doubt. Because he hasn't said Jesus yet. The God of Abraham glorified his servant. And he says Jesus. Okay, he says it there. But look at how he brings clarity. In case we wonder which Jesus we're talking about, and guess what? They knew. Peter is, he's really kind of rubbing some salt in the wound. Listen to this. Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate, when he had decided to release him. So the same Jesus that you rejected, that's the one who just did this miracle. See how he's confronting them with their rejection of Jesus? And to, to make it even worse, when they rejected Jesus, he says this. He says, whom Pilate... I lost my place here. Uh, uh, Whom Pilate, when he had decided to release him. So Pilate wanted to release him. He was going to were it not for the Jews. So that makes it even worse. And then he says, you denied, verse 14, the holy and the righteous one 
and ask for a murderer to be granted to you, and you killed the author of life. Listen at the irony there. Peter's choice of words is very significant. You granted a murderer, and you took the life of the life giver. That is so ironic. You, you chose death over life. They chose to, to grant a murder to be released, and that's talking about Barabbas from Matthew. Um, you killed the author of life, but here's the irony again, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses, and his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know, and the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. So notice what the miracle's about. It's validating that Jesus is the Messiah. He says, it's in the name of Jesus. That's how this guy's walking here. And you know him, and we are witnesses of this. So the gospel message is being put back in front of the Jews. And the lame man is an example of the gospel message. He's a validating sign that Jesus is the Messiah. Well, let's keep going here. And where am I at with my notes here? Uh, Israel rejected Jesus, the Messiah sent from God. We looked at that. Through their rejection of Jesus, they fulfilled the prophecies about Messiah. Look at verse 17. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But what God, this is beautiful, foretold by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. So he lets them know that when you were acting in your ignorance, you were actually fulfilling prophetic scriptures about the Lord Jesus Christ. Predictive prophecy. Okay, that was the joke last night. <laughs> if it's predictive, it is prophecy. Anyway, um, so, so they fulfill this in their actions. And, and he says, you did this in ignorance. And this is very interesting because in one sense, they knew what they were doing. They saw the miracles, but they refused to believe them. And yet, what Paul says in 1 Corinthians is, if they would have known, they would have not have crucified the Lord of glory. Uh, there, was, there was something about this that they didn't get, and so Peter can say that they acted in ignorance. Well, where does that leave us then? Okay, they must repent so that. So, by the way, I know that I'm doing two chapters tonight, but you notice we're going really fast, so this will be no problem. Uh, this, is, this is one of my favorite sections of Acts. And I think it is so important. So if you decided to watch like the post-game highlights, let's just tune back in for a couple minutes. All right. He says in verse 19, Repent, therefore, and turn back. And here's the so that, that your sins may be blotted out, that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus the Christ appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until the time of restoring, restoration of all things, about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. All right, so let me just kind of break that down for a second. Uh, I remember when I first read this, and by the way, I do say sweet home Alabama, and the reason I say that, I'm glad Tennessee won, but the reason I say that is that I was born again in Alabama. In 1997, I was down there tree trimming, and I heard the gospel, and I came to faith. So born in Kentucky, born again in Alabama. I'm as southern as it gets, all right? <laughs> and I went up to Michigan for a few years as a missionary, just like Amos went to the northern kingdom. And now I'm back. Shalom, y'all. <laughs> all right. So, so, but I want you to see this. Like, as a new believer, I'm reading Acts, and I'm reading how Peter says, if you repent... He'll send Jesus to Christ, and the times of refreshing comes from the presence of the Lord. And in my worldview, all I'm thinking is, oh, that means when you come to faith, Jesus comes to live in your heart, and it's refreshing, right? No, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about something that all the prophets spoke about from long ago. In fact, down in verse 24, he says, All the prophets who have spoken from Samuel onward have proclaimed these days. So when I open Samuel, and from there onward, I'm reading about these days. What are these days? These days of the coming of Messiah and what that's going to be. And he says to Israel that if you repent, he'll send that time of refreshing and the restoration of all things. So let me give you something here. Amos chapter 9, verse 11 God says in this future time, he will restore the tabernacle of David that has fallen down. 
that restoration will be the restoration of the Davidic kingdom that fell to Babylon, okay? That's why in Acts chapter 1, verse 6, the disciples say, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? So John Wiley has an 89 Ford F-150, 104 original 1,000 miles. That's pretty cool, 306 cylinder, nice truck. And uh, he is restoring it. When you restore a truck, you don't go buy a new one that looks like the old one. You don't make something new. You take what was there and you bring it back to what it originally was, and sometimes even better. And when God says he's going to restore the fallen tabernacle of David, it's going to be a restored Davidic kingdom with the ultimate Davidic king, Jesus, ruling and reigning on this earth and the nations flooding to Jerusalem to worship Jesus the Christ. That's what the prophets looked at. So what Peter is saying to Israel is, you guys, your Christ came and you rejected him. Remember the Gospels? Repent, the kingdom is at hand. The kingdom is at hand. And then all of a sudden, when they blaspheme the Holy Spirit, when they reject Jesus as the Messiah, he no longer says the kingdom is at hand. The Son of Man must be crucified and then buried and three days rise again. And now there's this mystery form of the kingdom, Matthew 13, that's going to happen for a certain period of time. And then the kingdom will come later on. So from a human perspective, the kingdom was going to come when Messiah comes and he came and it got delayed. From the divine perspective, God says, let me just open the curtains and let you know I had something else that I was going to do. Okay, so it's, it's a pretty amazing thing. And Peter is letting Israel know you're not going to get the kingdom until you repent. There is no kingdom until you repent. Now, I want to show you some of this because I think it's beautiful. Okay, um, I want to go through some of these prophets here. Second Samuel, what do he say? From Samuel onward. Yeah, this is the Davidic covenant. David, your house and your kingdom will endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. So the Davidic kingdom is going to last forever. And of course... Uh, to keep going through this, here's the Amos 9. Uh, in that day, I will raise up or restore the fallen tabernacle or booth of David. I will wall up its breaches. I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old. And, and in fact, when Amos talks about this, he says the plowman will overtake the reaper. So it's October. You're out there and you're still picking corn and going through your crops. And then it's November, and you're still gathering grapes, and December, and January, and February, and March. Why? Because the kingdom is so blessed with the abundance of God that you can't finish it. And now it's time to break new ground. The plowman is coming out in the spring saying, man, i got to plow the ground because it's time to plant. And the reaper's saying, I haven't even gotten in all the harvest from last year. It's the abundance of Messiah's kingdom when it is established on the earth. So that's what Amos talks about. And by the way, this will be helpful later on. He says, and the hills will, will drip sweet wine. And so there's this picture of this wine of the kingdom. That's going to come out after a while. Well, we know that the kingdom of David fell and it lie in ruins until this took place. When Jesus is going to be born... The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever and ever, and his kingdom will have no end. He's the one. The promised king is going to be born in Bethlehem, born as the king of the Jews. Matthew 19, 28. This is after he's been rejected, and we know where the story is going. We're told this. Jesus said, in the regeneration, or when I make everything new, or you could say in the time of restoration, refreshing, um, you who have followed me will sit, uh, the Son of Man will sit on his throne and you'll sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. The kingdom is coming sometime to a planet near you, but not yet. All right, let's keep going for a second. Acts chapter 1 verse 6, there it is. Lord, are you at this time restoring the kingdom? And he's like, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons. You go preach the gospel. Micah chapter 4, verse 8. This is what the kingdom is going to be like. I've got notes on this. I should probably look at them. Uh, when the kingdom comes, first of all, the divided kingdom will become one. Israel and Judah brought back together. That's Ezekiel 37. Israel will be exalted among the nations. Look at this. The Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from now on forever. And, and this daughter of Zion, even the former dominion will come, the kingdom of the daughter of Jerusalem. So the, the kingdom of Israel elevated over the Gentiles once again. 
Zechariah says that from the nations, ten men will grab the garment of a Jew and say, let us go with you, for we have heard that your God is with you. So Israel serving as the kingdom of priests unto the nations. So you have that taking place. Isaiah chapter 11 says that with righteousness he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. So this king is going to come and he's going to bring justice on the earth. There will be social justice when Jesus comes and unfortunately there won't be perfect social justice until he comes. That's just the way he is. There's only one Savior and it's Jesus. I love this. And the wolf will dwell with the lamb. And the leopard will lie down with a young goat. This is restoring to precursed conditions, uh, at least in a large degree. And, uh, and he says, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little boy will lead them. So I don't know, like think of the youngest kid in the church, and, and they grab a lion by the mane, and they're just, come on, come on. And you're not scared. You're like, yeah, that lion needs to go with him. Why not? Um, and then the cow and the bear will graze and the lion will eat straw like an ox. Then, this is very significant. The nursing child, so the smallest of human beings, right? The nursing child will play by the hole of a cobra. And the weaned child will put his hand on the viper's den. And I want to pause there. <laughs> the serpent came into the garden and set up a counter kingdom in rebellion against God. And when Jesus, the Son of Man, comes and restores the kingdom, we will have a human being ruling and reigning on the earth, and it's going to extend over the entire earth, and, and mankind will have dominion over the creatures once again. And I think it's symbolic of the fact that Satan's going to be dealt with. And, and even a child can play by a viper's den. It's a picture of restoration. And the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord. Habakkuk says the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, like waters cover the sea, all pervasive. So this is a time of restoration. This means that, you know, it won't just be at Chick-fil-A that someone might say, my pleasure, okay? Uh, you could be in any business during the millennial kingdom and you're going to hear Christian music on the radio. And you won't think that's odd. That'll just be the standard. Because he's going to be known throughout the earth. Uh, Isaiah 11 verse 10. Uh, they'll resort to the root of Jesse. I'm going to keep going. Micah chapter 4. He will judge many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares. And their spears into pruning hooks. Nobody's going to learn war anymore. This is the time of refreshing that comes. How? From the presence of the Lord, with Jesus coming to this earth and ruling and reigning. All right? Now, Isaiah paints a picture of what this is going to be like. This is important. Isaiah chapter 35, he says, Say to those with anxious heart, take courage. Your God will come with vengeance and recompense. He will save you. The scorched land will become a pool. The thirsty ground springs of water. Uh, grass becomes reeds and rushes. No lion will be there, nor any vicious beast go up on it. These will not be found there. But the redeemed will walk there, and the ransom of the Lord will return and come with joyful shouting to Zion. This is this second exodus, where the nations where the Jews are scattered will come back to Jerusalem as a believing group of Jews. And they will find gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing will flee away. And what's it going to be like when the kingdom comes? He says, and the lame will leap like a deer. Boom. There's Acts chapter 3. What time is it? How do I know that the times of refreshing will come? That Jesus is the one who can bring the kingdom. Isaiah said that when the kingdom comes, the lame man will leap like a deer. And what is happening while Peter is proclaiming this message? Walking and leaping and praising God. And in essence, every jump that he makes is saying, Isaiah 35, Isaiah 35, Jesus is the Messiah. He can bring the times of restoration. He is the one. Remember I said last night that you have signs and miracles and wonders? The signs signify. And this sign signifies that he truly is the Messiah who can bring the kingdom. Think about this. Jesus turned water to wine to say, I am the Messiah who can bring in the Davidic kingdom of Amos chapter 9. Jesus claimed to be the light of the world and he gave sight to the blind. He claimed to be the bread of life and then he took the five loaves and he fed the multitudes. 
<laughs> Jesus claimed to be the resurrection of the life, and then he said, Lazarus, come forth. So his signs validate his claims. And now this lame man walking again is testimony that Jesus truly is the one. And so as Peter is pronouncing to Israel that you have to repent if you want the kingdom to come, he's got evidence to say he truly is worth repenting for because he is the one. And so if they repent, verse 19 again, their sins will be forgiven. That's Jeremiah 31. The times of refreshing will come from the presence of the Lord. That's the prophets from Samuel onward. And he will send Jesus the Christ appointed for you. Jesus will come back. But verse 21 says, Heaven must receive him until the time of restoring of all things, which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. So, it's the first time I've ever had a drink of water while I'm speaking, almost. I always just carry it up here. Moses said, verse 22, this is important. Moses said, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him in whatever he tells you. So Peter says, here's what you got to do. You got to repent so that Jesus comes back, you get the kingdom and all that. He's talking nationally. This isn't an individual salvation message. It's to the nation. But now he's saying, but what if you don't? He says, well, remember what Moses said? The Lord God's going to raise up a prophet like me. This is Deuteronomy 18. And he says, if you don't listen to him, verse 23, and every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. So he's saying, you got a choice. Behind door number one is the kingdom. Behind door number two is your eternal destruction. What are you going to do? And so he says in verse 25, he says, uh, you are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, in your seed, all nations of the earth will be blessed. God raised up his servant Jesus. He sent him to you first, to the Jew first, to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. So Peter is preaching the message, and things are going great here. But notice what happens in chapter 4. The story continues. And as they were speaking to the people, so we're still mid-story here, mid-message, the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly disturbed or annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. All right, so what happens here? They were arrested for proclaiming the resurrection of Christ. This is disturbing because what the Jews did, they were jealous of Jesus, and this thing was getting out of control. All the people were following him. They were afraid that the Romans would come and just crush them even further. This is John chapter 11, so they're like, we got to do something. So they determined to put Jesus to death. They finally pull it off, and they kill him, and they think, we finally dealt with that. And then the guards come back, and they say, ah, an angel appeared, rolled away the stone, the body's gone. Well, okay, well, let's see, let's figure it out. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll bribe the guard, we'll pay off. We got this covered, just don't, don't worry about it. And then Peter and John go to the temple and raise a lame man from his lameness to walking and leaping and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection. And they're like, man, this is, this is getting out of hand. It's like a bag of goose feathers spread to the wind. How are you going to stop this? And so here they are. They're disturbed, and they're going to have to do something about it. Verse 2, verse 3, they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed... And the number of men came to be about 5,000. So this thing is growing whether you want it to or not. So you have a great initial response to the gospel message. Um, okay, what else am I going to say here? A question by the Sanhedrin. And this is verses 5 through 7. And uh, this is what Logos Bible software says it looks like. I think this is probably pretty accurate. Uh, so the, the Sanhedrin, you know, made up of 71 men led by the high priest... And what we need to know is that probably, like, Pentecost was 50 days after Passover. Jesus died on Good Friday, Passover Sunday. So we're talking, you know, we don't know how far away Acts 3 is from Acts 2. Probably not very far at all. We may be within two months, give or take a few days even, from the resurrection of, or from the crucifixion of Jesus. We could be three or four months. We don't know, but it's close. All right? These are the men who had Jesus put to death. They are dangerous. They have shown themselves to be committed 
to shutting down this message about Jesus. And now Peter and John are brought before them. Verse 5, on the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and all who are of high priestly descent. And when they had set them in the midst, so they would bring the accused. Do you see that in the picture? Uh, they bring the accused in the midst. This is intimidating. It would be very intimidating. They set them in the midst. They inquired and they said, by what power or by what name did you do this? Now, I, I'm going to take a guess and I think it's theologically informed. Jesus said, all men are going to hate you for my sake. And they are going to bring you before rulers. And don't worry in advance what you're going to say. Because I'm going to give you a mouth and mind of wisdom that they won't be able to resist. And so, even though it would be scary to be arrested by the Sanhedrin, when it's happening, just like God said it would, that would also have a calming effect, wouldn't it? Because he's in control. He told me this is going to happen. And listen, this is huge. This is like the application for the night. Okay, there will probably be times in your life and mine, and it could get more so as the years roll by, that you are tempted to... When you're called to account, when you're put under the gun, <coughs> it could be literally, by the way, uh, or figuratively, there could be times where what's going through your mind is, if I'm too bold, that could result in harm to me. So maybe I should just kind of downplay it a little bit, throttle back, fly under the radar. After all, if something happens to me, how can I keep being a witness for Christ? And so I need to play it safe. Because I need to live, because I need to be able to keep witnessing for Jesus. The disciples are not worried about staying alive. They're not worrying about self-preservation. He who loves his life will lose it. Their number one goal is being faithful to Jesus. And here they are before the Sanhedrin. And they know, this could be my last message. And I'm going to speak it to the people that I'm standing before and not hold anything back. And that's what Peter and John do. Verse 8, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, that's where the boldness comes from, said, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, don't you love that? It's like, okay, so let me just understand this. You guys are mad because a man who's never walked is now walking? Is that a problem to you? Is that why you're mad? They're just like pushing back here. I love that. Uh, by what means this, has been healed, this man has been healed? Let it be known to you. <laughs> he says, let it be known to you and all the people of Israel. He says, I'll tell you guys and I'll tell anybody who asks me, Jesus of Nazareth. It was Jesus. I am not ashamed of the gospel. I am with him. If you hate him, you hate me. I am with him, but he is the one. And so, boldly proclaiming Christ. And he says, whom you crucified, by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you, well or whole. And so he says, here's the proof that Jesus is the Messiah. It's this guy. Now notice what he says in verse 12 or verse 11. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders. You may have a cross reference that says Psalm 118. The stone that the builders rejected became the chief corner stone. All right? That's how Psalm 118 reads. But Peter says, let me do some interpretation. In this story about the stone and the builders, he's the stone and you're the builders. And you rejected him. And that's a problem. Here's the reason it's a problem. There is salvation in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. You just shot yourself in the foot because you have rejected the only Savior. You're the builders. You rejected the chief cornerstone. Uh, I just discovered this. I thought Psalm 110 was the most often quoted psalm in the New Testament. It's actually 118 from what they say. And I've read scholars that say both, and I've never counted them both. So uh, maybe it's a dead tie, and it'll go into overtime. And uh, yeah, all right. But but this is a major deal. They're showing that he's the one, and he's the only one who can save. Uh, a little bit further, we're almost done here. Peter and John threatened and released. 
they were warned to stop proclaiming Christ. Verse 13, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and they perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. They're taken back. These guys would challenge us. They're shocked and they're shocked by their boldness. And it was interesting, I had lunch with the elders today and Jerry Clark mentioned this, that, you know, when, when people begin to compromise the gospel to try to make it more acceptable to people, they're, they're giving up the only thing that makes it stand out. It is a standout message because it is, it is offensive, the offense of the gospel. It's not culturally acceptable. It's countercultural. It's, it's, a, it's a message that says, I'm a helpless sinner, and I need Jesus as my Savior. And so, you know, they are bold here with the message, and it's astonishing. They recognized that they had been with Jesus. But verse 14, seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. Like, how are they going to say anything against that? Here's the guy right here. And so they can't argue, and yet they don't want to give up. Verse 15, they commanded them to leave the council. They conferred with one another. And they said, what should we do with these men? A notable sign has been performed. That's evident to everybody in Jerusalem, so we can't deny it. We can't go down that road. So what are we going to do? And, uh, and then they say, verse 17, in order that it spreads no further, we're going to warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they call them in. They charge them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. And Peter and John says, you be the judge. Should we obey you or God? What's the right thing to do? And, uh, and it's interesting because... It just says, verse 21, when they threaten them further, they let them go. They, they want to punish them, but they're politically minded. And the crowd is pleased that the lame man is healed. So it's kind of like they can't touch the apostles because they want to keep their popularity with the people. And so they're saying, don't do this. And Peter and John saying, I'm going to keep doing this. Well, well, don't do it. And then they let them go. Listen, um, the scripture says that we are supposed to obey the governing authorities. Why do we obey the governing authorities, Romans 13? Because governing authorities are given by God. So then really, the ultimate answer is, we obey God. What if governing authorities tell us to do one thing and God says to do something else? I've already got my default, obey God. And I'll obey government if that works with obeying God, but if there's ever a conflict, and I'm not an insurrectionist, but I'll say this, you obey God. Because We're not going to give an account, ultimately, before the Supreme Court of the United States of America. We'll give an account at the Bema Seat of Christ. And uh, and Peter and John are bold to proclaim Christ. All right. Well, I'm going to jump to the end here. um, Because if I don't, the rapture might happen before we're done. Principles and application. God granted miracles to be performed by the apostles to validate this message as being from God. Salvation can only be found in the Lord Jesus. There is no other way. That really comes out prominently in chapter 4, verse 12. Also, um, as believers, we must be willing to stand for Christ even if we pay a price for doing so. I think that's something we decide now so that when it happens, we're not trying to figure out, like, man, what am I going to do? We stand for Christ no matter what. And... um, (laughs) <laughs> and I was thinking about one other point of application I wanted to make, but it's to do with the message tomorrow morning, so I'll save that for tomorrow. Uh, I hope that you are encouraged in the Lord, because think about this. Obviously, this was a testimony to the Jews. What if I'm an apostle? Because I'm getting hit hard, and it's going to get worse as the years go by. I'm going to remember that lame man walking and leaping and praising God. And I'm going to know that even though I may suffer now, I am associated with the one who's going to bring the time of refreshing. And I will suffer for his sake now, and I'll be refreshed when he comes. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for the faithfulness of the apostles to proclaim the word of God. And Lord, thank you for the Holy Spirit who gave them boldness. And God, we pray that we would be men and women of God who are not dependent upon our human wisdom but we are those that are dependent on you, those who are with Jesus, those who are dependent on you to give us boldness to stand for Christ. And Lord, as we do that, I pray that somehow, Lord, that we communicate a deep love and genuine concern for the very people who are offended by our message, and yet at the same time, 
a firm resolution to stand with Christ because we're convinced that he's the one. It's in the name of the resurrected and coming again one to bring the restoration that we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, our, our session for tomorrow morning is going to begin very promptly at 9.30. Okay, hear me again. Promptly at 9.30. As in, he, this thing kicks off at 9.30. Okay, there will be coffee, so let that be your motivator. Come here, get your coffee, get dialed in. Um, we're, so we're going to have a shorter session uh, for the Sunday school hour that will go from about 9.30 to 10.15. And then we'll have a little bit of a break, and then we'll have our normal gathered worship service in that Scott will lead us through the final session. Uh, remember as well, tomorrow night, 6 o'clock at the Herndons for our worship night. Um, we're going to be reading through the book of 1 Peter and singing together. So uh, a good time for us as a church. Let's stand now uh, as our, we have our benediction from 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 16. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way. The Lord be with you all. Amen. Amen. Amen.